welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. Topic for the day is going to be form and function. So how does the form of a piece of an organism fit its function? Let me get you your objectives and we'll get going for the day. First thing I need you to know by the end of this video is to understand the effects of natural selection on body plans of living organisms, so how does the whole process of natural selection actually shape what an organism is like, and provide examples to illustrate the relationships between form and function in living organisms. Pretty simple stuff, so let's go ahead and get into it. First thing that I want to note is that in the living world, form meets function. If something does not have a purpose, it does not have a place. Um, Natural selection is very good at weeding out things that don't really help that organism to survive. Now, humans, we might be the, the uh, exception to that rule, but an example, over on the right-hand side there, you see peacock feathers, which generally you would think, why would nature natural selection allow something as ridiculous and beautiful as a peacock feather? Clearly, it doesn't help the survival of the organism, but actually it does. Um, male peacocks are actually male peafowl are known as peacocks. They're the ones with the big old tails which are used to display to females which allow them to mate which increases their chances of survival and reproduction. So even in the case of beautiful peacock feathers they do have a function. So just kind of get in your head that natural selection is going to weed out anything that does not help that species to survive. One example of this is going to be the size and the shape of an organism. Now an example of this Organisms that live in an aqueous environment, we know that water is like a thousand times denser than air, it is much more viscous, it is much harder to move through, so any bump or protrusion on the body is going to cause a lot of drag for the organism that is trying to move through water. So this is why most aquatic organisms have evolved a fusiform sh shape, which just means that it's tapered on both ends. Um, we know it as a streamlined shape. <clears throat> and though they're not related to each other, things as different as like seals and tuna and dolphins, they obviously did not evolve together. They had their own separate paths, but through convergent evolution of having to swim through water, they ended up with this streamlined shape. So that would be an example of the form, the shape, fitting the function swimming through water. Um, this also applies to body support. The bigger that an organism gets, the more structural support it needs. So in terms of like a skeleton inside the body, the bigger the body, the bigger the skeleton is going to have to be, the thicker it's going to have to be. And the same goes for exoskeletons. So there are limits on how big an organism can be, which limits how fast it can run and how agile it is and all that kind of stuff. So. This would be an example of size and shape actually shaping the form, or the environment actually shaping the form of the body. Another example is in exchange. Um, all organisms need to exchange waste with the outside world. Okay, They need to take in some nutrients, they need to get rid of waste. There are basically two strategies. Um, one is the flat or single cellular body plan. If you are single celled, then you can easily exchange stuff across the surface. Now remember that when surface area and volume are increasing, they are not proportional to each other. Volume increases much quicker than surface area does, imposing a limit on how big a cell can be. So one strategy to get around this is to have a flat body plan. Um, an example of this would be a flat worm. Those flatworms we talked about the other day, they aren't very many cell layers thick, and because they're flat, they can get most of their cells in contact with the outside environment. But if you're going to have a more complex body form in that you got like organs and cells and things like that all packed together and specialized, then you got to find a way to help those cells exchange materials to get rid of waste or to take in nutrients. So the most common strategy is to have an internal like circulatory system and fluid around the cells. So all the cells in your body have got fluid surrounding them in some way. They exchange material with that fluid, and then that fluid exchanges material with the circulatory system, which we know moves fluids throughout the body. So that would be a strategy of overcoming the need to have all of your cells in contact with some aqueous environment so that exchange can occur. You've probably heard many times of this whole like hierarchy of organization in the living world, but I just want to make sure that you got it in your head. Generally, the way things go is you have got a cell. Similar cells are organized into tissues. Similar tissues are organized into organs. Organs are organized into organ systems, and organ systems are organized into an organism. So that would be like a bottom-up approach to organization. If you were to take a top-down approach, you could say that 
digestive system. Digestive system is composed of like the mouth and the esophagus and the stomach and the small intestine, the large intestine, and the anus. And then you could zoom down even further and say the stomach is highly folded. It has got gastric juices. It digests food. It absorbs, well, it digests food. And then you could say like the small intestine absorbs nutrients and things like that. So when you're looking at how living organisms are organized, you can either take a bottom up or a top down approach. And while we're talking about tissues and stuff, it's important to recognize that all animals are made out of tissues, and there are a couple of basic categories of tissues that all organisms are made out of. So there is epithelial tissue, and this is tissue that is used for exchange, covering, lining, covers the outside of us, covers the insides of our organ systems, um, the esophagus, things like that. We got connective tissue, which holds things together. Examples of that are going to be like muscles and ligaments, things like that, or not muscles, uh, bones and ligaments. You got muscular tissue, which is used for movement, and you got nervous tissue, which is used for signaling. Um, you can also see there is bone tissue, there's cartilage tissue. Cartilage is generally a type of connective tissue, but recognize that all of the tissues in a living organism can be organized into a couple of major categories. Finishing up, this is the last slide for the day. Um, as we were talking about form and function, obviously all of these tissues that are working with each other must be coordinated and they must be able to communicate. So when we're talking about more complex organisms, there are two major strategies of communication. You got the nervous system and you got the hormone system or the endocrine system. They've got two different ways of going about doing things and thus two different functions. So with the endocrine system, Usually what you have in the endocrine system is a couple of specialized glands or organs releasing chemicals into the bloodstream. They circulate through the bloodstream and act on some specific target somewhere else in the body. This system has a slower response because obviously this stuff has to be diffused into the bloodstream. It's got to make it to its target organ and then it's got to cause a response. But it's usually a long-lasting response that could last for you know minutes or hours or longer. The other system that we've got is our nervous system. Nervous system is like a set of wires running through your body, and it is quick, short-lived response. So depending on what your body has to respond to, either the endocrine or the nervous system is going to respond. And a lot of times they work in coordination with each other, where the nervous system might initially respond, and then the endocrine system will sustain the response or some action. So this is, a again, form meets function. Each of them is specialized nervous system has got axons and dendrites that are touching each other, are very close to each other so that they can, you know, rapidly communicate a signal. Endocrine system has got a bunch of soluble molecules that diffuse into the bloodstream and can travel very rapidly. So I hope that this little tutorial has given you at least some idea of how form and function fit together within the living world. I thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.